Hello, this is another video I'm making. I'm hoping it's not too loud. This is the second one in this video series I'm making to promote my <coughs> my masterpieces that I've created over my uh, lifetime that you maybe don't know about. But anyway, I wanted to hurry up and make a second video in this series for two reasons. One, because uh, my friend the Funky Man seemed to, like he was trying to make fun of me for wearing a hat in the last video. So I wanted to wear do one without a hat on. on him. So I don't know if that... Um, I don't know what's wrong with the hat, but I hadn't bathed that day. And so today I bathed before making this video and I put some hair product in, but I got too much hair. But I want probably, I guess everybody just to know that I do have hair. Um, so that's <clears throat> number one reason for making the video. Number two reason is I realized I want to follow up on one or two, <coughs> maybe like 35 things that I mentioned in the last video and didn't have a chance to digress into. Um, and by the way, hopefully this video is not that long as the last one, because the last one was an hour and four minutes long. Anyway, I came to my attention, um, because of my remembering it, that in that video, I think I unfairly um, maligned, unintentionally and unfairly maligned DJ Yellow from NWA, because I was talking about NWA, um, and I was going through all the people in the band, and I mentioned him, and I was like, I don't know what he did, actually. So he didn't do any rapping, apparently. I thought at one point back in olden times, like when the stuff was coming out, 1989 or what have you, that I maybe read that he was like a drummer. So it was like he's sitting and playing. He would play like one drum thing, and they would record it and use it. I don't know. Anyway, but, yeah, and then I remembered later that he was actually like the co-producer so he didn't rap, but like Dre did, but both of them sort of produced it together. And so I did remember reading an interesting thing, talking about somebody back then watching the two of them working on something together. And it was like, it was eerie to watch because they were both working and doing a tons of different things while this recording was happening or this mixing or whatever. And um, the entire time they were not speaking to each other at all. They were so in sync. Presumably they were in sync. Um, but, um, yeah, it could have been that one of them was just screwing something up, but they didn't want to stop. Uh, anyway, I'm going to assume that since it all sounds good, that they probably were in sync. So, anyway, that is what he did mostly, I guess. And so he, I, he's, that's probably him there um, on the cover of NWA, my um, first, ed first edition, whatever, CD. It'd be cool to have a vinyl record of this from back in the day. But anyway, so that's what I got there. So that's what that's what DJ Yella did. And uh, I partly remember that because after I made that video, I went downstairs and I put this in. This doc, bio doc, you drama um, from a couple years ago. This is straight out of Compton movie with Ice Cube's son playing Ice Cube. But, um, yeah, that was a good movie when it came out, and mostly I was like, ah, oh, it's good for people to, under to have a place to go and get the story and whatever. Um, so I got that out and was watching it. And No, I didn't start watching the movie. I – what did I do? I was watching the bonus features. So I put on the bonus feature, like Becoming NWA. It was about the actors um, learning how to be the characters and everything. And anyway, so I put that on in the afternoon or the evening and watch that bonus thing everything was cool interestingly the night before the blu-ray player in the other room i had which is a very similar samsung model to the one that i was watching this on had gotten stuck in an endless reboot cycle booted up showed the start screen and then immediately seemed like it crashed and tried to find a disc and start up again do the same thing over and over again and i was like oh this is this is a problem um so that night we i, I we were not going to watch blu-ray or dvd anyway so then i went in the other room and got this old apple tv and put that on we watched that and everything's great we're streaming something off of amazon prime probably and um then the next day i used the other also samsung blu-ray player almost the same model and watched special feature off of this blu-ray becoming nwa and that was all cool then i stopped and i did some stuff and then that evening a few hours later start up that blu-ray player to watch something and it started also doing the blu-ray 
endless reboot cycle that we had seen previously at the bedroom. But um, that at that point, probably, um, I thought that I should Google it because it seemed like a significant, uh, like a problem that probably everybody was having. And I did see a lot of posts about Samsung Blu-ray players going to an infinite reboot cycle. And um, it said something that was my first thought, which was, did they push out a bad firmware update just the day before? And it, it got to the bedroom one first, and then it got to the living room one, and sort of bricked both of them temporarily or perpetually. But anyway, so yeah, some people were like, probably maybe pushed out a new firmware thing, but it said Samsung got enough sense not to push out a new firmware edition usually on Friday, and probably not the whole bunch of models. And I think I usually get notified when a new firmware update is to be installed on a thing so that I can approve it and so forth. Um, but anyway, so I didn't think they'd gotten new firmware updates and I was like, oh, and sure enough, somebody else thought, oh, they said it probably, possibly more likely that it was a expired SSL certificate, security certificate for connecting to some website. And this reminded me of things we had to worry about when I was working at two previous companies where we were not just making like a software thing that you could download, but we were making a physical product and you had to have some software on it, which would immediately connect to some web service or whatever, but it needed to have some sort of security built into it. But it needed to have some kind of security that wouldn't expire since the product could potentially sit on a shelf for three years and then be booted up much later than the time that you made it. And anyway, so the people were saying that probably they didn't push a new firmware edition, but they did maybe have a, an expired SSL certificate or something. So anyway, it seemed like that's what maybe probably happened. Uh, it could be that some dude who worked at Samsung maybe had a, a calendar notification for when to update the new, <clears throat> or, you know, to re refresh the SSL certificates and push out a new firmware version with that before they expired but maybe they laid that guy off and then he was like all right whatever it's your problem now so that's 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 a theory a popular theory that i had uh, was that maybe was what happened anyway so i had always been rightfully apparently concerned about having the two blu-ray players be the same manufacturer and model so i was like this is a good time to maybe get some different one first of all so we're like like this vast pile of dvds and blu-rays i got around here won't go to waste <clears throat> but also take advantage of the fact that now i need to buy one maybe now is the time to buy region free blu-ray dvd player and uh so then i got this this got this show this show today and it's, you could see it says something like blue region free. Uh, there was also a Sony one, but anyway, so I got this. Um, and um, why you care about region free? Oh, let me tell you. So, um, yeah, mostly you're in America, you get like normal region DVDs and Blu rays, or maybe it's region one. But they usually don't say the region. But anyway, so you get this Blu-ray or DVD. It's made for this market. You put it in the machine you bought in this market. Everything's fine. However, any Blu-ray or DVD player apparently is physically capable of playing any DVD or Blu-ray manufactured for any part of the world. But it's artificially crippled in order to only play certain regions for what one time upon reading about this seemed like potentially somewhat plausible intellectual uh in a intellectual uh, property protection reasons um at the present moment i cannot remember exactly what they were all i can remember is that i was somewhat convinced that it maybe wasn't as evil and irritating <coughs> as it initially seem to me and would naturally seem to any right thinking citizen who might feel that information wants to be free anyway so i bought this i haven't hooked this one up yet this region free for the first time so now i'm no longer a slave to the 
DVD region, and that's supposed to even maybe do PAL and so forth like that, and not just NTSC. So anyway, I got that, um, and part of the reason I got that was on account of not too long ago, I bought finally bought a used copy of this Beatles anthology thing, which I forgot existed because it came out, and they made some CDs with a lot of previously only released and bootleg version song, Beatles songs and alternate takes and stuff, but I forgot that there was this big thing of um, a lot of interviews and junk like that. So I ordered this copy of this, and one time I neglected to sufficiently scrutinize the Amazon or whatever listing and failed to notice that it said somewhere on here, probably here, I don't, I don't have these glasses on, but probably said on here, you can't watch this in America. Uh, it's suitable only for persons of 12 years of age and over. POW! So that's one problem. This is POW, um, as opposed to NTSC, um, which originally I thought just meant a different number of vertical lines of resolution, like 600 versus 525 or 5. Well, I don't know. Anyway, so it's a big problem. But I, when I got that, I was like, ah, oh, this is no good. But maybe I can watch them in my old computer um because that seemed to work okay but it worked okay for a while but then some of it just um seemed to make it freak out so anyway i may i'm going to try that and this when i get this hooked up um and maybe that'll work um or maybe they were used and maybe they just messed up but anyway so i got this other thing i got that also is a compelling reason for for having the region free thing so a lot of stuff show you here and I brought all these as physical objects so I don't have to do post-production but it's kind of cumbersome anyway so I got this big box here it is Gary Newman CDs and DVDs so he doesn't make any blu-rays yet but anyway so he recently moved to America about six or ten years ago and uh, then started releasing a lot of concert videos in Region 1. Primarily made for Region 1. So they work fine here. And you may be buying recent stuff and everything's great. And everything's good. And you get... Where did it go? Um, whoa. And everything's cool. But then after you get like about 25 of those things and you go looking for older stuff this is the newest thing i think G gary newman with some like bulgarian orchestra um uh, it's got some pictures inside or whatever some discs in this book anyway so this is like his latest album and just general concert set with the anyway so this is working america just fine that's great this this is a work in america but actually it's not a dvd even so yeah there's other stuff, however. I think maybe this, what is this, like hybrid? I don't know what this is. But this is pretty good, whatever it is. I, I recognize what it is sufficiently to remember that it was good quality content, but what that content is, I don't know. Anyway, so then I go far deeper and deeper down this rat hole of Gary Newman stuff that you could find on video, on DVD. And so here's some older stuff from maybe the late 90s or early 2000s or whatever. And some of this stuff, however, you can get it fairly cheap if you keep your eyes open and look and buy used and stuff like that. But you may find that some of it turns out to be from Australia. And then you may find that you end up with some junk that you bought that doesn't play on American typical normal region one dvd players so um hopefully now they have this region free dvd player and blu-ray player i'll be able to put it on the tv downstairs and i have this thing plugged into it that guarantees you explosive sound um sort of a surround sound thing but yeah explosive sound so i'm going to be able to finally watch some of these treasured um, Gary Newman memorabilia videos in their full glory with exploding explosive sound so that is a tip for you in case you want to buy a bunch of Gary Newman stuff of which some of that might be 
foreign made DVDs from before he lived in America. But good for him for making all these DVDs. He makes an album and then goes on tour, videos the tour, immediately, pretty quick, makes a Blu ray, no, a DVD only so far, uh, with good sound and everything like that. And then puts that out so he gets to sell that that again. And then he may make a, a CD of the audio from the live thing. So he sells that. So he kind of got it figured out. He doesn't have a huge fan base, but he um, makes an album. And then instead of waiting for four years until he makes another album or whatever, he does his interim stuff, like these Blu-rays. And, no, no Blu-rays. Everybody's mad that he doesn't do Blu-rays. Um, but I'm just happy that you get the video and the explosive sound that you can listen to. So, oh, anyway, so I got that. Here's his most recent album. Um, so I got a bunch of junk here. To, I, part of the reason I brought out this box of Gary Newman, there's one song where he, on one of his fairly recent albums where he says, this is my small black box filled with shame. After I heard that, I thought of my small cardboard cardboard box filled with Gary Newman. But anyway, so I want to put some more of these things that I've been listening to at times um, into my box of shame. This is... Uh, someday I'll go through every one of the Gary Newman things in this box and then tell you about all of them and what I like about them and what I don't like and everything. But this one sneak peek this one what i don't like is this cover it's awful i don't know who picked that cover picture i'm pretty sure it wasn't him but anyway this is from like exile years so that's pretty cool because sacrifice and exile were his first good albums for a long time but anyway i thought explaining this blu-ray and dvd regions would probably be more exciting for you and make, make history come alive for you if i could demonstrate how this will affect a person's daily normal life the daily completely in normal life and then i'm put these back consolidate all my gary newman in my small cardboard box of gary newman um so there's oh here's here's the thing i found from the single from the sacrifice album that i had never seen before this one has his own label for a while almost too early for doing that but he tried it um and then i think he stopped doing it because partly it was a pain in the butt to be dealing with absolutely every part of album creation and distribution and everything um and then i think he started clawing his way back to public notice and so other people would help him or something anyway so that needed to go in the box of gary newman what else i got here um um i already explained there's this dj yella dr dre um yeah so uh, i was talking to somebody and they were like oh one of my favorite albums is dr dre the chronic and i'm like uh i believe what turned me off ah, to a lot of rap after this amazing thing amazing significant historical album um was what turned me off um i somewhere i have the 100 miles and running ep from nwa after ice cube left um and there's like one good song on that and um then there's a lot of dissing of ice cube on that but um that was kind of what turned me off and seems still to turn me off in a later attempt to listen to the chronic by dr dre is the now completely irrelevant dissing of other people on um, their tracks when now you can't nobody remembers what was going on back then um, but anyway so the ice cube made this one they were trying to diss him about going off and doing this on this fairly not that awesome ep whereas he had just released this awesome um, album um, with the public enemy guys but he was mostly not dissing them however then i bought this i waited till this came out it was the very next thing that came out and for some reason i don't remember what is on it i'll have to listen to it again but i didn't it's like uh, just different slightly versions of some of the songs off of off of 
America's Most Wanted. But yeah, this didn't really like excite me that much. I was kind of disappointed. And like back then, you know, you had to go and buy everything. You couldn't go online and watch it on the YouTube yet. On account of it was only it was the 20th century. I actually had the YouTube in the 20th century. But anyway, then um, that was good. But then once I spent the money on getting the second thing, I'm like, mm, that's not that good. Um, and so then I kind of stopped watching or stopped buying NWA and Ice Cube records for a while. But then this dude goes off and he just like sat down sometime and wrote the screenplay himself. The sp- made up the story and wrote the screenplay for this Friday movie and it was totally good it's totally fine um and I don't know probably at some point maybe he had friends or possibly self-interested media industry people who were perhaps encouraging him or giving him guidance on how to write a screenplay but maybe not um i the one story i heard of him talking about it he was just like i spent this month just pounding this screenplay out my laptop maybe he did that it's totally possible he's a smart guy um but anyway so he was making these and i watched that one these i didn't watch until later the sequels but yeah that came out and i was like damn that's totally good um a lot better than the screenplay i wrote at that time or before that time which was a screenplay version of crazy monkey which was the first Billy Starfire and the Orbit Boys album is supposed to star the abominable funky man um, in the lead role. And <clears throat> I got that in the other room. It printed out. I only have it. It only exists in one copy, I think, in a printout from a dot matrix printer. I don't know where I printed that out yet back then because I didn't have a dot matrix printer. I had this cheaper thing that used this pen and drew around and it made it like on a cash register receipt. And it was for the TRS-80. Anyway, so I never watched this movie, so... I can't say anything about this movie that's all about the Benjamins. <clears throat> but someday, uh, maybe I'll watch it. Um, I sure hope it's the right region. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, I did buy this when it came out, and I realized at some point that now you go kind of looking for it, and it doesn't have the main reason you bought this album by Ice-T and his metal band that came out. Because everybody was all incensed about the song Cop Killer on here. And um, I don't remember how it goes that much, except that he says cop killer. But um, I think maybe I wasn't super into this album. I can say with fairly strong degree of confidence, I was not super into this album. <clears throat> but I don't know if that was because it was good or bad. or it would, I don't believe it was off-putting, but I think perhaps it was just not as um, interesting to me or as as good a combination of insightful and self-aware comedy as like ice cube um plus all these things were adding up you're buying all the stuff you couldn't check this junk out in advance you just roll the dice and buy it anyway so that's all that stuff um if you got a dvd player or anything then maybe you should probably also watch this because yeah there's a legitimate sort of reason that there's a fuck the police song on here um and um it's good to watch it's good to watch this because it dramatizes what it's like although ice cube says it in many songs which is um in my neighborhood there's a lot of police brutality that's why i hate those people the police and there's a sort of dramatize that in in this but uh, so yeah so anyway MC Yella helped with the production, and then I think maybe after the heyday, of <coughs> height of um, artistic pinnacle of creativity and um, relevance, then I think maybe Dre was doing his thing, and then Yella was doing other people's things and stuff, and then maybe they're passed across or whatever. Hopefully everything's cool now. I think everything's cool now since they made this movie. But anyway, so Ice Cube is like almost pretty much my same age. But I'm more of like what you might describe as like a late bloomer. So um, I didn't start making making albums until like 1995 or so. I made most of the songs on my first album entitled Star Witness by Jason Musser and The Limitations of the Source Tape. And I mentioned it multiple times um, ad, ad nauseum. 
in my last video, but I couldn't find a copy of it or find an image that was visible from my phone into this. So here's the cover that I made of Star Witness from like 95, but also um, probably didn't actually pull it all together and come up with this amazing cover art until like 99. So here's one of the few extant copies of original pressing of Star Witness and the jewel box is broken. Um, but here's the CD. Uh, you burn these CDs yourself and then you had this plastic thing and you put the sticker on it and put the disc on it and mushed it down on there. Um, and anyway, so that looks pretty good. But yeah, if you find one of these, probably gonna be worth big money one of these days. Um, but I also mentioned that, well, first of all, obviously this, in my initial creative vision, the idea was that this album art cover would be done by a courtroom sketch artist, but I couldn't find one back then because the internet just hardly existed. And the um, internet presence of like courtroom sketch artists was not as as widespread as it is today in 2020 so i couldn't find one and so i just drew this picture myself and i couldn't even color it in then but um maybe you find a picture of this on the web and you could download i was talking about not having a coloring book for sale but you could get this printed out and then you would color it in yourself if you want to this is a good back cover picture but this is this does attempt to be an accurate representation of my primary instrument at the time which is the yellow jazz master which I think is over there, yeah. So you can judge for yourself how good this, how good this looks. But um, then also is a somewhat r accurate representation of my self um, and my amplifier and my wah wah pedal, um, which is used on the first track of this album, which is an instrumental track. I don't want you to get the idea this is an instrumental album because it's not that at all. But it starts with an instrumental song entitled Pediatrician. Uh, um, so then it's got mostly all other non-instrumental tracks. And in other words, real songs. So you have Bob Dylan's 82nd Dream, which you might think is a Bob Dylan song. It's not. It's a song I wrote and then for a super clever reason called it that. But anyway, then there's another. Okay, there's another instrumental. And then there's another instrumental, which is, let's see. The, the track four is entitled Mag ma um which is just me playing on the yellow guitar all by itself with me all by myself so it's uh, it's like an eruption except not as exciting which is then why i called it magma um instead of eruption by eddie van halen anyway next song is dogs with human heads which is a real good song um a cr chronically popular song with crowds and everybody uh, also, oh, I didn't tell you this, but I'm writing a novel based on dogs with human heads in a style of like Edgar Rice Burroughs or a um, ooh, Robert Howard or those dudes. So I got it all planned out. And I, you know, this isn't one of those things where a guy says, I'm going to write a novel and you jump into the first chapter writing the final, what you think is the final actual text. And then you realize that you don't know where you're going with it. No, not like that at all this time. It's, I've got it all planned out, all excitement ties together and wraps up to a super satisfying planned out in advance finish. So I'm working on the Dogs with Human Heads novel. Um, uh, next song, let's see, is Riverside Drive. Um, oh, that was a good chord progression um, and uh, interesting song is pretty rocking then labor of love which i was trying to write a sort of uh stacks records soul song um so that's good and relevant and interesting then family ties oh that's a good one yes uh, maybe if i hold it this way you'll like it to be able to read the follow along at home family ties actually that was a song i didn't like when i wrote it but it was like oh okay it talks about some interesting stuff 1995 or so talking about excessive student loan debt and uh living with your parents again after college or your girlfriend's parents anyway so that's what that song is about so old that it mentions 
it mentions um, uh, a BA is nice to have, looks fine upon your wall, but what you really need to know is Lotus 1, 2, 3, which you probably don't even know what that is because it, it was like the first big spreadsheet program and changed a bunch of stuff, I guess, and whatever. But um, then I realized recently, like four years ago, that it doesn't even exist anymore. It was sort of quietly copied by Microsoft Excel, and then someday everybody woke up and Lotus123 had died and was totally gone, and everybody only remembered Microsoft Excel. But anyway, so that that was mentioned back there. So a lot of exciting time capsule elements to this old album of mine. Um, also good drum sounds from this Yamaha thing that I had. Uh, then uh, instrumental with the saxophone called Lake of Soup. Uh, then uh, a song called French Fries, Chocolate, and Carrot Cake. I'll talk a lot about that song Sunday, probably. Um, it's, it's a slightly interesting story, but uh, not that interesting. Um, then a song I wrote called HLR Song 1103 about the home location register, which is a critical component in a cellular infrastructure network that keeps track of where all the cell phones are um when somebody's trying to contact you or your voice leave your voicemail or send you a text anyway so that i wrote that then uh, the title track star witness this is the penultimate track on this album it's a pretty good song i'm working on a, a, a new recording of that song um that'll make the production sound more good um but anyway, so that has particular charm and some good sound and a nice harmonica solo that I played on there with this harmonica I found on the ground on the tree bank along the um, 63rd Street um, one time. Anyway, so it happened to be in the key that I needed for this, so that all worked out great. Um, but um, I believe in the last video, another inaccuracy I may have said was I believe that I had written the Star Witness song during the Bill Clinton impeachment trials which I remembered recently when I was trying to practice that song and potentially to play for a show. And then there were other impeachment trials of a later president happening. As I think of it, I'm not sure that Bill Clinton was still in office at the time I wrote the Star Witness song. However, that was probably still fresh in my mind from just a couple years previously. And then there's O.J. Simpson trial and Newt Gingrich trial and stuff. So there's always some trial with Star Witness. So someday my marketing... My marketing plan for that song gonna pay off where somebody Google Star Witness and ends up accidentally getting the song and appreciating its artistic majesty. And the last song is Perpetual Lotion Machine. It's, you guys should check that out. It's a good um, good preview of a lot of the or B Hammond B3 organ playing type sounds I would later make more often on other recordings. So that pile of junk is out of the way now. Um, uh, one thing that I was thinking when I was w reading about NWA was I knew that uh, somehow Easy e had sort of funded some of their initial stuff with, with money from selling drugs. And then i read as you probably could too and maybe often already have i read the other day that the story was dre was arrested for something and he couldn't get out of jail and need somebody just to be post bail and this musical guy he was working with he said come please bail me out of jail and the guy was like no way man you owe me some some money so i'm not coming to put more money down for you to get out of jail and so he couldn't get out of jail but he needed to get out of jail for some reason right away and somehow he knew Easy E, and Easy E had money on account of being a dope man, and he wanted to get into music business, and knew Dre was kind of getting good at that, and so he bailed him out, <clears throat> and then the rest is history. <clears throat> and it made me sort of, sort of wish that me, and maybe, maybe me and Billy Starfire had known like a drug dealer or something back when we were in high school, because then maybe probably it would have been even more famous by now than than we are um or organically but yeah so um uh yeah you might say well this is this is bad if uh, all, all this stuff came out came about because of easy e being a, a dope man but could you blame him necessarily 
how come he was the dope man? Well, he lived in Compton, California, CA, and his and um some people with credibility have claimed that the crack cocaine epidemic in places like Los Angeles and America in general in the 80s maybe wasn't a random spontaneous thing that just occurred all by itself that maybe it was really caused by the US government planting stuff in these communities like coming up with a special version of cocaine and then introducing it to these communities and then letting it take hold and then ravage these communities which were already in bad shape because they were forced to be all together um, and a lot of people of color could not get uh, mortgages or buy houses outside of certain parts of certain cities so they all ended up in the same part of the city which would be maybe strategically designed to be kind of far from where any of the good jobs are anyway so perhaps it's an inspiring tale rather of long-term government um, uh, conspiracy uh, plus racism and everything to um, keep certain people down yet however one of them would use this money from this to make the this group that um, brought more enlightenment to the rest of us about the plight of uh, the people in this city and many other cities around the country. So you might want to Google a person called Gary Webb, W-E-B-B, W-E-B-B, -B, -B, Gary Webb, who seemed to be like, I, as I recall, if I recall correctly, seemed to be the guy who maybe sort of did some investigative journalist work and figured out that you know this crack cocaine epidemic was maybe really caused by the Reagan and then maybe the Bush um, administrations um, or the CIA potentially at their encouragement. And it seemed like this is plausible on account of CIA was also selling drug like cocaine in order to buy weapons to give to the Sandinistas in the Iran Contra thing where there was a trial and the star witness was Oliver North, um, who was this uh, uh, sort of CIA army dude. And um, it became clear from the trial, at which he was a star witness, that he definitely did this thing. They like broke this ban against selling arms to certain places in order to sell arms to certain places. Anyway, so yeah, probably look that up. Look up Oliver North. Look up, uh, this dude's still around and hasn't suffered for his part in any of this. But um, anyway, look up Gary Webb and uh, then you can see the story in a manner that is better than that, which I can recall it right now. But we're already, speaking of Gary Webb, do you know another guy named Gary Webb for real? You may know him better as However, Gary Newman, whose real name is Gary Webb, W-E-B-B, W-E-B-B, Gary Webb. He decided to be called Gary Newman instead. And in my last video, I mentioned how producers often, how artists often, not infrequently, if they don't stay individual contributors, artists, Often they will move into production roles, which actually initially seems sort of lame, but actually then the more you get old, some things that you used to think seemed lame for people to do as they got old seemed less lame. So anyway, um, then actually good. Like somebody who came up and learned the hard way on his own, how to make his albums and stuff like that then becomes a producer as he gets older and starts seeing other people who he's like, oh, I can help that person. I, see, I get his vision. I can help him achieve his vision on account. I already know all this junk. Anyway, so Gary Newman, who was born Gary Webb and still sometimes is Gary Webb, I think, at Thanksgiving or whatever. Anyway, 
he um I don't know where he's going with that, but here's some here's some stuff that I can't fix in fit in the cardboard box of Gary Newman because it's twelve inches and the box is apparently only eleven inches wide. So I can't get these records in here. Um and this is Bob Dylan anyway, so that shouldn't go in there. Um this telecon whoa, telecon. I got this. I got a lot of Gary Newman when I was young as cutouts. Um there's another cutout. Whoa. Oh, screensaver went on. I hope you can still see me. Okay. So yeah, this, so this this is a great album, Gary Newman album, for Gary Newman first album basically. Really great. It was sad though that this was the first time when I listened to a CD reissue and was like this CD does not sound as good as this final. This sounded much rawer and more rocking on this record here. Um, anyways, uh, I mentioned that because at some point I was talking about another example of the artist to producer transition, and I believe I mentioned Nine Inch Nails Trent Reznor. So this is some weird version of Pretty Hate Machine. I don't know. Look at this. Ooh. So then you got this. I don't know. You can't really get an idea what the original album cover looked like. And it's all unfold all kind of crazy ass ways. Anyway, this, uh, I lent my, uh, my original copy, CD copy of Pretty Hate Machine to a police officer, as it would happen, and I never got it back. So that's why I got this fancier, kind of irritating edition. Trent Reznor, here you go. It's all going to come together for you now. This is the moment you've been waiting for. Trent Reznor made this actual great album. Um, sounds great. The words are okay. Sounds great. Very rocking. Made this great album. Trent Reznor said every day when he was making this album, he listened to this album. I think, yeah, this album. The Pleasure Principle by Gary Newman. Gary Newman's like third album. So not th I don't think this, not this one. It could have been this one, but he probably has his own copy. He probably still has it. This copy I did not have until somewhat fairly recently, but it's, so it's remotely possible. This could be the Trent Reznor copy. Then maybe he sold it off or whatever later on, and then I bought it, but it seems unlikely. Anyway, so he listened to this album every day when he was making Pretty Hate Machine. So that helped Gary Newman <clears throat> get a lot of credibility and – Whew, awareness among newer people when Trent Reznor graciously acknowledged him as one of Trent Reznor's heroes. And in the Trent Reznor to producer career path, he produced one of these Amer Marilyn Manson albums. Like this is uh, Antichrist Superstar. It had a little sliding thing on the outside of it, but I lost it somewhere. But anyway, this picture was more interesting anyway, I thought. So anyway, I think Trent Reznor probably produced that. I don't know about this. This, what's this about? I don't know. This is some single, and I can't read what's on it because it's too small. But however, if you know the Gary Newman catalog of albums from the old days, maybe you know this record, which is Gary Newman Replicas, which for a long time has been my favorite album. And periodically, even if I don't listen to it, just for normal purposes, I listened to it again to see if it still is my favorite album. And at the last time I checked, it was. And anyway, so I think this Marilyn Manson album cover is like kind of supposed to be based on that because it was an iconic album cover. And this is my copy that I bought when I was 16. It had already been out for many years. I only learned about it, Gary Newman on account of Billy Starfire's brother, I think. <clears throat> but I bought this record. And then now you're like, why is it in this ca weird case? Um, that's kind of not that cool. It's in this weird case on account of, I took it in 2016, I think, and went to Gary Newman VIP meet and greet in addition to these three days of concerts that he did here in Chicago. Different album every day. And I did the meet and greet in one day, or maybe it was a different year. I don't know. It might it might have been a different, yeah, it was a different year. I'm sorry. Uh, it was a, the previous tour which was the year before the year before that that's when i did the meet and greet that's when i took this and had him sign my prized copy of prized and very influential copy of replicas which is my favorite album so there was something else oh at if i were to do any post-production 
it would be to drop in a picture of me with Gary Newman. Whereas part of the reason for doing the meet and greet, not only to maybe get the once in a lifetime chance to meet my one of my heroes, was also to take him the this and tell him about how I wrote this title track to this album, which is I entitled Androgynot, <clears throat> which was sort of a, uh, a, a like a good spirited sort of spoof of Gary Newman's songs. Um, because he got a lot about being like a, maybe like a robotic prostitute. And so that's what the, that's what the androgynous song is about. Um, the bisexual robot sex slave, which is the idea I came up with. Um, anyway, so, and a name I came up with, perhaps the idea is not that, um, impressive since the way I got the idea was listening to songs about robotic um, bisexual sex slaves but maybe the interesting part there the novel contribution that I made there was coming up with the name for it which was an androgynon but anyway that's a great track you should probably buy that Billy Starfire album or something I don't know all, any of the stuff you buy would be good for me if you buy it from wherever it was I put it I mentioned not remembering where I put it all for sale um, online recently, but I, I mentioned that in the last video, so you go back in that last video and see what I said there, even though I basically didn't say anything or give you any useful information. But Google around, you could buy all this junk. I think I got the Facebook backdoor frontman page, and I got links to some of it, or maybe it was Bandcamp or something weird like that. But that reminds me, Bandcamp, oh, that's a common music site. Was it the first sort of indie music site? I wonder. And it was not. I mentioned mp3.com in my last video as a place that I released Star Witness. And it was like at the time, I guess you could probably, you could upload just the front cover, not the inside thing. Um, and you had no control over this and you had no control over the back thing. <clears throat> but it was like a print on demand thing, but for CDs and arguably, plausibly, you could pay to download the mp3s which explain why the name of the site was mp3.com maybe anyway so that was an old thing that no longer exists here is the one copy that i purchased of star witness cd create on demand from mp3.com check it out and to see what it was going to look like when everybody else downloaded them so i don't know if anybody ever bought one or downloaded it it's possible this may be the only one from mp3.com so the big collector's item right here. If you want this, then I would sell, happily sell this off to um, an excited fan um, uh, for approximately $10,000 US. Or maybe if you want, I'm, you might be able to talk me into $10,000 Canadian, but just uh, hit me up with the email or a direct message or something if you're really interested in that and we can talk about where to send the money or the um this is a well here's more stuff here's a gary newman sticker sometimes it's hard for me to take a sticker and stick it onto a thing because then i won't have the sticker anymore or the ability to stick the sticker on anything once i put it on one thing so i had this for about two years now i'm getting ready to put it on something pretty soon but for now for safekeeping i'll put it in the box of my small black card my cardboard box full of gary newman Interesting other thing about NWA that you hear, especially about Easy E, right? Easy E, Eric Wright, right? Easy E was that he wanted to get into the, the rap game and he had the dollars and um, he just didn't know how to work any recording stuff or whatever, but smart enough to try to just find somebody who already knew how to do it and then bail them out of jail and have them owe him and stuff. Anyway, so everybody seemed to think that he had sufficient personality to be a rap <coughs> rap performer. But he had a little maybe stage fright or lack of confidence. And so they say that for the, his first big song, Boys in the Hood, that the way they had to record it was they had to record one line at a time and then wind the tape back and then roll it in again and then have him deliver the next line because 
at first he couldn't do all the whole song or the whole verse or whatever in one tape so they would do it that way and hopefully you will not hear this story and think all oh, that was pathetic um, because hopefully you'll see this as like a, a sweet story where these guys were supportive of this dude possibly because he was buying them like Roland 808s and one inch recording tape but probably also because they liked him right that uh, they were supportive friends that they were like you could do this and so they worked with him to get him to do one song the hard way one line at a time and then after that it built his confidence and so he was able to become uh one of the big big rappers of the time um but that reminded me of i also mentioned the beach boys right in this last video i'm sure you remember um but so the beach boys also recorded things often one line at a time and why was that for i will tell you is on account of the vocal harmonies were so complicated that they didn't have time necessarily to work out the whole thing so the whole group could get it all right in one take <clears throat> although apparently brian wilson you know probably had it all in his mind and stuff um but he would teach them the harmony parts like one line of the song at a time so they also according to the story that i read on the somewhere they also would record songs one line at a time and not just the first song they did but probably multiple songs um so he would teach like these five guys all their different parts they would do this line let us hear, let us. anyway so like that with the, except with more voices and stuff and they would do that and um so interesting isn't it how things go around and come around so anyway i also found I had to dig through under some Beach Boys stuff. So here's some Beach Boys stuff. Pet sounds like. Here's an album Brian Wilson from Beach Boys made. He made it in a house, in the basement of a house, like 10 miles from here. And I'm not even in California. And then here's some other album. And then here's the, the when he finally got together and tried to really make what was supposed to be his masterpiece smile as he'd intended and not as it had sort of been forced to be pulled from his his hands. This is a good Marilyn Manson album. It's not androgynous, but it seemed like there's a similar zeit, zeitgeist going around at the time for androgynous naked robots. Here's another Beach Boys. This does not go in the Marilyn Manson pile, but I'll put it there for now. Oh, I'll put this over here. There's a great song on this album, um, which is actually a compilation of car songs that they had made or something. So maybe this is not the first appearance of this, but there's a great song. Well, I think Little Deuce Coop is, is actually pretty great. I like the songs in this album because there's like ridiculously specific jargon, um, which is always a fun thing in often in some rap songs. But uh, yeah, that I like to do that too. Anyway, so words you don't normally hear um, used correctly. Anyway, so hey, Little Deuce Coop, that's a great song, especially the drums that the Hal Blaine guy plays for him on that one but what is the song our car club if you're unfamiliar with this song listen to the song our car club i have nothing in my currently extant catalog of originals comparable to our car club but it is about how they want to have start a car club <clears throat> and then they talk about well the great fun things they're going to do with this car club that they make and there's like one verse where they explain this p appears twice in the song the things they're going to do is um have meetings and charge like charge dues and because that is one of the few things they mentioned doing with this car club in this two minute song it comedically to the modern listener perhaps suggests a disproportionate amount of interest in scheduling meetings and collecting dues on the part of the fun-loving car aficionados who were the Beach Boys. They're really looking forward to 
scheduling those meetings and stuff. But anyway, so that it seems like maybe I talked about everything except I don't think I did. I got through most of the pile. I talked about how I have this album called Backdoor Frontman by Jason Musser. <clears throat> and then later decided to call myself Backdoor Frontman. Um, retroactively adopting the title of the song as my own pseudonym or nom de plume. Anyway, and then I was talking about how often you have the case where there's a song that appears on an album that was released after a previous album, which was named the same as this song on this later album. And anyway, as my example, I use Waiting for the Sun by the Doors, which this album, as you can clearly probably maybe see, is entitled The Doors, The Soft Parade. It is open up like this album even though there's only one record in it. And um, I am not old enough to have bought this album when it first came out, nor was I old enough to buy the previous one when it came out, which was Waiting for the Sun, which was the one I talked about. But that one, Waiting for the Sun, had no Waiting for the Sun song on it. But this one is the album that came out next, I think. And it... It also does not have Waiting for the Sun on it. Maybe it was Morrison Hotel that had that. Well, that that didn't work out as well as I'd hoped. But I'll try it again. Anyway, here's another record. Giant, super heavy record. I bought this because there wasn't that much merch when I went to see Gary Newman at the Talia Hall in Chicago. It's like on a Wednesday. It was the most recent time I saw him. And so I was like, oh, what the heck? I buy this poster. I got downstairs. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll buy this record. This, I think it is good because it has like one song that's not on the regular CD or digital. But I was like, it's been a lot of years since I bought a Gary Newman record on record on vinyl. So what the heck, I'll do it. So I did it. And I haven't played it yet. Um, here's a picture disc that my girlfriend got from me of Gary Newman from The Fury. Dun, dun, dun. Here's another one i'm not sure it's on here yet but i don't want to make this video i don't want to risk losing the viewers interest and attention by pulling that out but so there's there's other gary Newman. so now i'm consolidating my gary newman piles around here in boxes i mentioned beach boys in the last video and how they kind of were influenced by the four freshmen here's the four freshmen one two three four they look like they're about 50 though but I mean, 50 years old, not 50 people. But anyway, so yeah, whoever the four freshmen were at the time when Brian Wilson was listening to the radio and records and stuff, <clears throat> they were really good. And you'll see videos of them. Sometimes you'll find videos from back in the day. I believe the four freshmen were not always the same four freshmen, and they definitely weren't freshmen the whole time. But anyway, I think maybe some of the people rotated in and out over the course of 50 years or so. But... You would see videos of these dudes, and mostly they'd be standing there with no band, but then one of them would have a guitar, and one would have a trumpet suddenly happen to be holding behind his back. That was kind of interesting, but the more interesting thing was the vocal harmonies, um, which are influential to Brian Wilson, the Beach Boys. It took me a long time to get into the Beach Boys, despite having all these records from my parents. <clears throat> took me a long time to get into the Beach Boys because I preferred the Beatles um because the beatles all wrote their own songs and i guess brian wilson wrote most of the beach boy songs sometimes that mike love guy wrote some too so okay they wrote some too but out of the beatles seemed like they did cooler things and talked about different things and they didn't always talk about driving a car and scheduling meetings and things like that and having fun um so i was able to relate maybe more to the beatles songs that they wrote than the happy Beach Boys songs about sun and fun and so forth. Anyway, I also found this stack of Joy Division CDs when I was going through some boxes, Unknown Pleasures, Closer, only two released during Ian's lifetime, and then this Still, which is like some other junk they had laying around with him on it, and then some live show. <laughs> Turns out there are kind of a lot of live concerts captured in video that you can get to now on the YouTube with Ian Curtis and Joy Division. 
And this was like a good compilation that came out about the time I bought it, whereas all these others were old when I got them. But uh, now the Substance uh, compilation, I think, is super old. And they probably got some different repackaging of all that stuff. And why do I mention that, you ask? And I will tell you now is because I accidentally, when I made this album, uh, come on, man. Focus. This, I'm hoping it will iris down here. Come on, man. Maybe I got to turn the br I tried turning the brightness up last time, which didn't work. So this time I'll try turning the brightness down a little bit better. Here, here like that. There. Oh, you can almost get an impression of what this album cover looks like on this phone. When I recorded this title track to this EP, a Class Trader, <clears throat> I recorded a guitar solo in it, and it accidentally came out sounding very like a Joy Division guitar solo played by that one guy, Barney, who was a guitar player for Joy Division. And part of the reason was not just the style that I played it in, but the fact that I had two microphones in the room connected to the recorder, and I accidentally turned on the wrong one that was far away across the room from the amplifier instead of right in front of the amplifier. And the natural reverberations that occurred in the basement are between the microphone and the amplifier <coughs> made it sound very reverb -y like Joy Division. So if you enjoy Joy Division, as like I showed those albums, then probably also you'll enjoy this latest official release from Backdoor Frontman, which is entitled Class Trader. Especially look out for that. <coughs> that echoey <coughs> guitar solo. And I think that's all I had to mention to you today, except I was going to see if I could go back on my phone browser and whoops, and to give you a sneak peek of the Backdoor Frontman website. You still can't see that. Anyway, maybe it'll iris down if I push it real close. Real close. Okay, there. Yeah, you can see here's Backdoor Frontman website. That there it got all the links to pretty much everything you need to know about that I've made that you can enjoy and watch and share to all your friends and loved ones, including all these comic videos and things like that. So I'm showing you this because it probably intrigue you and pique your interest. And then you go and see backdoorfrontman.com yourself. Um, so enjoy. And until next time, that's all I have to say. <laughs>